The Ministry of Community and Cultural Affairs is fundamentally about people. Therefore, the Ministry is proud of its programs, Treasures, which brings to the fore facets of Bermuda's culture through the lives of people, our senior citizens. We treasure our seniors as they share their memories with us. They provide enrichment and show us the broad spectrum of our cultural mosaic. I hope that you will enjoy, as I shall, treasures. Bermudian Mr. Robert Lee has had an interesting and varied life. A talented stonemason, he is also gifted with a beautiful singing voice. He talks to us about growing up in Bermuda and his successful career both here and in the Turks and Caicos Islands. My parents, which was Stoey Lee, uh, I don't know such an awful lot about the Lee side of the family because he, my father always said my great-grandfather, he came from South Africa. He's a big, tall, seven-foot chap. I guess this is where we boys get some of our height from. But my father was a little, little bit of a man, a little six, six, eight, or five, eight. And uh, my mother, well, they were both Bermudians. My mother, she's was born Doris Gwendolyn Dill. They came from up in the North Shore Pembroke area, and I think my father came from the similar area, and they sort of grew up together, so I guess they met as kids, and they married very early, around 20 or so. And um, out of that, here I am. Okay. What was your father doing for a living? Well, he was quite a guy. He done a little bit of everything. Well, when I came around, he was a stone cutter, but he had been a sailor, farmer, cook, you name it, wherever he could make the penny, he was willing to do it, to get it. And um, he was a very good, good cook, whatever he done. He was good at it. He, 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 put, he put his best in it. And he taught us, I'm going to say everything that he knew, he taught us. So during my time, he was a stone cutter for about, oh, 35 years or so. He was a stone cutter. He did take a break out from cutting stone. He went to work on the base during the war years in 1939. And uh, around 44 or so after my mother passed, he came back in the stone cutting business. And that's what he done mostly, stone cutting and masonry. He was a stone mason. Uh, well, he was, he, he was a pretty intelligent guy. He, he could put his hands to almost anything. There was one um, thing you mentioned before. He had a, a fall from a crow's nest. Oh, well, during the time, his sailing days, I, I wasn't born then, but he fell out of a crow's nest of a schooner and fell, I think it was 42 feet, head first, hit the deck, ruled overboard, and he broke both of his, his wrists. So he was out of circulation for about two years. You know, that was during his, his sailing days. I guess that was been around 1924, 25, because I didn't come along until 29. <laughs> Where was the family living at this time? At that time, we were living over in Smith Parish. That's where I was born. And uh, they called it the, the locker. I don't know really how it got its name, but from 
my experience, I would say it got its name because the property was sort of, it was only one way in and one way out. So it was sort of uh, landlocked, if you will, so they, once you were in, you were locked in. So I guess they just nicknamed it the locker. So this is where most of the boys, most of the family grew up. What are your memories of that early period of your life when you were growing up there? Well, I remember I always had chores to do. <laughs> yeah, we had, Pop always had a cow, goat, chickens, a piece of farm that we would have to hoe off and whatnot. So whenever we came from school, it was always something to do. When it wasn't that to do, we would have to go to the stone quarry and uh, clean up the quarry and whatnot. So as far as uh, stone cutting is concerned, I guess I could almost say I was born in the quarry. <laughs> Went in it very early. What was always something to do if it wasn't to clean the soil off of a block that was coming out little bits of rock around the hill because we always believed in keeping a clean quarry. Because like he said, you never know when you had to run to get out of the way from a piece of block falling on you. So you didn't want no, no obstacles. So when we went by in the afternoon, that was our job. Your father referred to himself as an engineer and uh, he told me about the saw, how he moved the teeth. Yeah, well, he, he, he gave himself a title and he rightly deserved it because he was fascinating to watch. He, he used to, while well, he used to sharpen his own saws, do everything himself, and he never lent his tools. I used to often hear him say, listen, I don't lend my tools, doctors don't lend their tools, and I don't lend mine. And again, he, classified himself as a stone-cutting engineer and to watch him work he was rightly so because I've seen times he would take a big piece of rock as half of the size of a muter if you will and uh, undermine it so and the rock when it fell it, it would sort of turn around wherever position he wanted it, he would undermine it so that when it gave away here, he would have a pry or something and it would hit the pry and roll itself right over where he wanted it to go. And, and he was fascinating to watch. Um, the thing you said about his saw was interesting, how he opened up the... Piece. Oh yes, the way he... Now, he's a pretty strong, powerful little guy and the saws, you know, when he was pulling that saw, the sand wasn't, uh, it wasn't enough room in the saw, the way it was factory made, to carry the sand, to pull it out. So he had his saws uh, specially sunk, as he used to call it, it was another little groove up into the saw. So when, the, when you pull the sand out of the the saw cuff, the, uh, instead of it jamming the saw, it would go up in this little groove and come out. And, uh, and he was the only one that I knew of. This is why he now wanted to lend his tools. That had his saws done as such. And he used to sharpen them himself. How did he do that? He had a file and a, I can remember a file and a little hammer where he would open them and cut them either way. And uh, if he was going to sharpen his saw today, he would lay it out here in the sun and let it get hot. And he would sharpen it when it's nice and hot and you could tap it and open it according. So I guess this is why he called himself an engineer. <laughs> Rightly so. I can remember as a little, little boy, I used to go on the farm with my mother. During those days, we used to export a lot of celery, thyme, onions, 
and quite a few different vegetables then. And uh, those days, a lot of the housewives used to go and work on the farms, such as weeding carrots, onions, or bunching thyme, and things of that sort. And I can remember where I was sort of playing around on the side of the garden because I, unfortunately, I never went to school until I was about seven years old. So I, I went to school at Flats Hill, St. Mark's School it was called then. It's just a little building going down Flats Hill. And from there, we came, went to the Ool Elliott School. That was built in 1934. Did you enjoy school? Yes, when we had maths. <laughs> that was my top subject in school was maths and English. So when it came to the other parts, I, I wasn't too keen on that. I remember we, especially at Elliott, we would have every Friday morning, we would have to study a chapter of the Bible and we were called on to read or uh, memorize a verse of the chapter that we were supposed to study. And I just couldn't remember. So I was Mr. Wise Guy. I would study the tenth verse and then go and get myself in the tenth position. <laughs> but the teacher got hip to that. So she started jumping all over the <laughs> start jumping all over the chapter. So you had to either study the whole chapter or you were in trouble. Okay. Um, tell me about Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham. Oh well when I was the eleven, twelve, at that time I wasn't that academically inclined, so I went to uh manual training. We used to teach trades up at uh, the Central School at that time. And uh, the moment I went there, he noticed the potentials that I had for, I'm going to say, the construction field. And he took me right under his wing. And uh, he taught me quite a bit that the other boys never knew anything about. Because I remember when I was around 12, 13, he used to take me in his office. And at that stage, I learned how to read blueprint, etc., and whatnot. And he saw the potentials in me because he was a very outspoken man, very strict disciplinarian. And uh, I remember he used to call me sensibly and my brother dumbly and I couldn't see why because my brother Charles he was really academically inclined and he you know he was a real crackerjack to me but anyhow I had the potential for the, the construction field the tradesman and uh, that was it and we I used to visit him quite often right up until he passed reasonably whenever I came back to Bermuda, I always go and visit him because he always liked for me to come by and visit because he always wanted to know just how and what I was doing in the construction field. Okay. You left school at 13. What happened after that? Well, when I first left school, I went to work, as I said, as a delivery boy. And from there, uh, at 14, I lost to my mother. And I promised her that I would be a plumber, so I wanted to be a plumber. I always loved masonry because I had seen my father build his own home and I played around and it was like I also, from a little fellow, I liked to make cake and play around in the mortar. It was just like making cake. So I enjoyed that, but uh, I also enjoy the whole, the whole thing about masonry. But I promised my mother I would be a plumber. During my plumbing experience, uh, then 
I was working at Clayhouse. They were converting the Clayhouse building into the nightclub. And uh, then it was a lot of, still using a lot of cast iron, lead pot and blue lamp and all the big heavy tools. So, and during the time we were, had to do a job in Southampton. And I rode all the way up Southampton with my load of tools. And when we got up there, found out we didn't have the blue lamp. So I had to ride back down Clay House to get the blue lamp and back up uh, Southampton. And that's one of the things that forced me to knock plumbing in the head. Forget it. <laughs> and I, I, I sort of got out of plumbing from there and went back to Mason, which was my first choice in any case. Mr. Lee started out as a plumber's assistant as his mother had wished, but was keen to follow in his father's footsteps and was quick to show his skills as a mason when the opportunity arose. Anyhow, uh, when the roof was finished, I went to work with this guy. I don't remember who he was, but he, I was working with him and I was watching him work. And I said to myself, I could work as good as him or better. So I went to the foreman, which was Jack. I knew him pretty good, so I could talk to him as I thought. I said, look, Jack, I'm not no laborer. I'm a mason. He says, you're a mason? I said, yeah. He says, well, why don't you bring your tools on the job? I says, well, I was just starting out and I'm a little timid. So he says, well, you bring your tools on the job and I'll see what you're made out of. Well, I didn't have a tool, didn't even have a rule. But anyhow, I went in the quarry and lifted my father's saw and square for a start. And I bought a trowel, hammer, or a hatchet, level. And then we used to use uh, the wooden hawks. So my brother made me a hawk. And I think I got a full set of tools then for less than 25 shillings. <laughs> So anyhow, I took them on a job, and uh, they placed me, and they gave me uh, six months, six minute raise, gave me three shillings and six months. So I worked along, and then a man by the name of Daniel Augustus, he was their leading mason at that time, and uh, he took me right under his wing. And he says to me then, I'm going to make you one of the best masons in Bermuda because you're young, you're strong, you're tall, and you've got a lot of reach, so you've got to develop speed. And he was right on my back all day. But anyhow, I don't regret it. And he was always calling on me, Lee, 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 until one day I says to him, listen, there's nobody else on this job but Lee. So this is when he explained to me that he was really, he saw the potential, something like Cunningham, and he was forcing the best out of me. So when he was satisfied that I was ready for the field, he left me alone. I became a privileged character. Robert went on to make a name for himself as one of the island's top masons, but by the time he most needed work, newly married with a young family to support, there was very little work around in the post-war years in Bermuda. Uh, during that time, I was looking for a job, and this gentleman by the name of Frank Medeiros, he asked, him, what are you doing up here? He says, I live up here. I'm married now. He says, you're married? Says, yeah. He says, wow, I hate to see a married man out of work, but I don't have nothing to do. Only thing I have is a pit to be dug. I said, I'll do that. So I guess that took me back to my father's days, doing anything for that dollar. So I dug the pit, and uh, it was close to the water, so I had to do it with dig the pit with the tide. So sometimes when the tide was low, early hours in the morning, I would go down and dig the pits to, to catch the tide. Anyhow, I finished that and 
he was quite pleased with it. So he says, well, being you said you're a mason, you might as well go up this, build up the sides because I found a lot of field, soil. So I built up the side, and he says, well, put the top on. So it ended up, I got a week out of it. And on Saturday, he asked me if I would come here to help him to pour a slab. And uh, he then decided to keep me on. And that was my first tournament job, if you will, after marriage. But anyhow, I ended up with uh, four or five kids at that time, and I thought it was all over. And we were living in a little house over North Shore. This is when I first started to build this house here. And uh, television was just coming in Bermuda then, and my wife says to me, Robert, you've got to get the children a television because the next door neighbor, they let one in and the other one comes around here crying, his aunt Eva wouldn't let me in and blah, 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 and whatnot. So I says, Jeebus, I can't afford to buy a television now. I want to finish the house. Uh, but now I had let this rest for a while and I built this house over on Hermitage Road. So. She says, well, I don't care. You're going to have to get the children the television. So I went home this evening, and I got them all together. And I said to the kids, well, listen, Daddy wants to finish the house. Let's say I have 100 pounds. It can take 100 pounds to finish the house, and will take 100 pounds to get a television. What shall I do? They all practically aren't together. Finish the house, Daddy. The house was finished, and the family did get a TV eventually. Robert went on to fulfill his dreams and built homes for each of his children. Then, with the family grown up and gone, Robert decided to take a trip to the Turks and Caicos Islands. So, and by going there, I found the island a lot like Bermuda was oh, let's say about 50 years or so behind Bermuda because, as I said earlier, it was still a lot of lamp light outhouses and uh, a lot of things which took me back as a little boy in Bermuda. And uh, the main thing that attracted me was property, and property was very cheap, and being a builder, so I decided to buy and build. And I came back and forth uh, while doing that. And I got it finished and put it on rent. Came back to Bermuda for a while. But while I was building, I noticed that they didn't have too many skilled islanders at the time. So this is when I approached government and asked because they would implement masonry into the high school curriculum. And it took them two years before they decided to say yes. So I then went into school and taught for five years. We used to have a lot of fun, especially when we had the multiple choice as far as uh, what's the proper methods. So I would put, do you multiply by three, divide by four, and minus six or something like that. So <laughs> I, I had to smile one day. They said, but no, Mr. Lee, that's not fair. You just do that to confuse us. I said, why do you think I did it? <laughs> Make sure that you're paying attention. During my time, I've done a reasonable amount of uh, troubleshooting for the museum down there because it's an old building built out of stone. I don't know whether it was Bermuda stone or not, but it built out of stone, and I don't know quite a bit of repairs down there, so any time they had troubles, they would uh, call on me. And also, I done a reasonable amount of repairs over Salt Key, over the White House. Uh, during the early days, they used to take stone from here for ballots for the boats, and take them to Salt Key. 
and because this is where most of the trading was done from Salt Key. And uh, then one day they decided they have all of these stone and what we're going to do with it. So they decided to build this big white house and they stored salt in it, plus the dwelling upstairs. And it's a uh, hundred feet long by 50. And it's a big, very large building, one of the bigger buildings on there. And that is also made of all Bermuda stone and Bermuda slate. So this is why they, none of the people on there knew how to mend the stone. This is why they sent for a Bermudian to, to mend it. Robert is now retired and enjoying spending his time with his family, singing in a local church choir, and giving advice to friends on building as and when they ask him. Right now I'm in enjoying the social side of life. I'm going 35 now, so I'm taking it easy. So I'm putting more time in Bermuda. It's more social life in Bermuda. Like, uh, well, for about 10, 12 years in Turks, I sort of got away from dancing because they don't have this type of uh, ballroom dance and etc. down there. So now that I'm home, I can get back into that and enjoy it. But um, as far as working is concerned, if Mr. Wright comes along, I'll pick and choose. But I'm more or less taking it easy. Plus, I have enough to do around the house, keeping the house looking right and whatever. So such things as, well, like taking the little grandchildren to school. And like the other day, I took she came called me at 7.30 in the morning, wanting to know if I could take her fishing. Anyhow, we went fishing and she caught her big fish. <laughs> she was quite happy, so anyhow. Today, a lot of the kids seem to let their circumstances dominate the destiny. But um, that needn't be. You can do it. It's out there for all of us because looking back at myself as a young man, my mother died when I was 14 years old and I was practically on my own because my father, he was still a young man, and all my brothers and sisters, they were all older than me, making a life of their own. So, but I had a goal. And pick it, stick with it, and you can make it. It's there for you. Because, you know, I, well, I grew up in a single family, my father this and my father that. That's hogwash. It's all up to you. You can do it. Because the similar thing I used to tell the kids in school, stick with it and aim and aim high. At least if you miss, it fall amongst the stars. We leave you now with Robert Lee singing one of his favorite songs. Hold him to the tree. At last he cried, it's finished. He bowed his head and died. Oh, what a sight for our Savior's crucified. And I learned that when I was about eight years old, and it sort of stuck with me. That's one of my favorites today.